Good morning. Good morning, church. We need to, need to follow the example of Pastor BJ here. He's already standing, ready to pray and ready to go. <laughs> Father, we are grateful for your love. We are so blessed in all that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we stand before you today, preparing our hearts and minds to be open to you as we lift up our love and song, may your spirit work in us as we sing the truths, the messages of these songs to draw us closer to you and to help us have a greater oneness with you and a unity with each other that pleases you. Father, may you be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. have a seat. Yeah. 
let's try this again. We'll do five. An extra special good morning. <laughs> there we go. All right. Well, hey, we want to welcome you and say thank you for joining us as we worship the Lord. We are glad that you are here to worship together with us. And isn't God good? Amen. He is. And uh, he is worthy to be praised. And uh, we are excited about doing that together with you today. And uh, so this is our time for prayer. So as we do that, I um, want you to go ahead and get out your prayer sheet. And um, we're going to remind ourselves of some of the prayer needs that we have um, uh, in our body. But uh, along those lines, too, uh, before we do that, a couple of things. Um, we will be taking our offering after prayer time. Uh, there's a sign-up for summer camp. If you or one of your kids wants to go to camp, please get that in. We are starting to plan for um, the activities that we're going to do, and we need to start to get numbers. So if you could do that. And then also Easter flowers, if you would like to arrange to have some. Uh, the sheet is there also. If you could fill those two out and put them in the offering plate, we would appreciate that. So as we go to uh, our prayer, um, we received an update today on uh, Joanne Berry. And uh, she is uh, not doing very well right now. Um, she is uh, struggling with congestive heart failure. And so uh, she is just physically struggling, doesn't have much strength. And um, uh, also she has had some uh, correlating mental fogginess that is going on that goes with that age and also with the congestive heart failure. So we want to ask that you'll continue to be in prayer for her. Uh, a number of you have sent cards and letters to her. And uh, uh, her daughter wrote back uh, to give us thanks for that. She said, we want to thank you so much for your cards and letters and the love that you send on a note. And uh, don't forget that ministry of writing to one another. It means so much. Um, also, her husband, Bill, uh, had a fall a couple of weeks ago, and he broke a hip. Oh. And so he is in a rehab facility for that. So... Uh, be in prayer for Joan and Bill both, as it's just a very difficult time for them. Also, we want you to be in prayer for uh, Jack and Diane Fulton's niece, Amy Weaver. Um, Diane, do we have any other update other than that she is? No, she just said she's at home. Okay, she is at home on palliative care, so be in <laughs> prayer for her, and uh, especially for her spiritual state, and um, that uh, she would open her heart to the Lord. Um, be in prayer for uh, Art Bingham as well. Uh, he had a trip to the ER this week and uh, has bronchitis uh, very badly and uh, uh, also had some other things going on. But uh, just be in prayer for he and Charlene as uh, he recovers from that and uh, for strength for him. Um, let's remember also to pray for our missionaries. Uh, our missionaries of the week are Stephen and Egla Bahago. They are missionaries with Word of Life in Nigeria, and uh, we, uh, in our last, I think we had them in our last update as well, but basically what you need to know is this, the election is over, but the chaos is not. Um, the Muslims are still creating just havoc through the country, and so we need to really be in prayer for them. Uh, first off, for safety, uh, as they travel about and as they do their events. The, the amazing thing is this, the answer to prayer right now is this, that they have been safe and they've been able to minister to a lot of people in the last year. Uh, they, they minister to thousands of people a year through word of life. That's the answer to prayer. The need for prayer is that that obviously gets the enemy's attention. And so uh, be in prayer for them. Also be in prayer uh, as they minister to the Fulani people and uh, they have 17 evangelists now amongst the Fulani people, which is amazing because that is the Muslim group that is the most, doing the most persecution. And so God is working in that. So pray for that ministry as well as the Bahagos do that. Let's go to prayer, and if our men would come forward, we'll take our morning's offering afterwards. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the chance to come together and to do that in peace, Lord. To do that without fear of who's going to come through the doors. And God, that we can do that and we can proclaim your goodness. That you are good. You are good all the time. 
and that God, even when our situation seems bad, you are still good, you are still loving, you are still with us. We walk nowhere without you walking with us as your children. And so we thank you for that. Today, Lord, we ask for uh, Joanne Berry and Bill. Lord, we pray that you will help her body to strengthen. We pray that you will be with her spirit, that, uh, Lord, we will be your hands and feet, that she will know your love through us. Uh, we pray for her as she recovers a little bit, and, uh, Lord, as her daughter is there with her, that you would give her strength as well. Lord, we pray for Bill, and as he's in a rehab facility recovering, we pray that you will bear him up in spirit as well. We pray that uh, his heart will turn to you, that he will draw on your strength during this time. And Lord, uh, it's just not easy or fun when we hurt. And so, Lord, we pray that that would be the case. Lord, we pray for Amy Weaver now, that, Lord, she is close to that day that you say it's once to die and then the judgment. And, Lord, she is getting closer to that. And so, Lord, we pray for her. We pray that you will draw her to yourself. That, Lord, she will turn her eyes up to you. We pray for the doctors as they minister to her, as they treat her, that you will give them skill and wisdom. And that, uh, Lord, in the end, that you will be glorified in this. Lord, we pray for Art as he has had a really rough week. And, uh, Lord, has uh, just difficulty breathing and coughing and all kinds of stuff. Lord, we pray for him, that you will strengthen his body. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will strengthen him in spirit as well. We pray for Charlene as she ministers to him, that, Lord, you will uh, give her caregiver mercies, that you'll give her strength, that you will bear her up. And, uh, Lord, that they may, even in the midst of the storm, know your peace and your joy. God, we pray for the Bahagos as they're ministering in Nigeria. And Lord, uh, I just think about them and how every day they know that their life could be forfeit. And yet, they choose Christ. And what an example to us, what a witness to us. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing upon them. We ask that you will keep them safe. We ask that you will frustrate any efforts to stop them. Lord, we ask that you will open doors for ministry. We pray that the doors that are open will continue to stay open that the name of Jesus Christ can be spread. Lord, we pray for the Fulani ministry as these are the ones who are persecuting you. And Lord, on the cross, you said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Lord, these are the ones who are persecuting you, the Fulanis. Lord, we ask that you will forgive them, that you will open their hearts to salvation and that there might be a rich harvest from those who are trying to persecute you. That just like Paul, they might do a one eight. And so, Lord, we ask for that because we know that you are the one who can do it. Now, Lord, as we give our tithes and our offerings, may we give with a cheerful heart. May you be glorified. And may you take that which is given and use it to spread the gospel here in Kenton, in Hardin County, and to the uttermost parts of the world more and more each day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
wanted to mention that this second song we're going to do, it's still one of the newer ones that we've learned, but um, I just love how it reminds us that in John 10, Jesus tells us that, that we as his sheep, he, him being the good shepherd, that we know his voice. And really all we have to do is listen. Sometimes it's amazing how God can speak to us uh, himself in a still small way, even in just a quiet way through his spirit, making things known to us. But so often it's just from the word and in time and prayer. And uh, but that song, this song encourages me to listen, to just know that he's willing and wanting to speak to us. Three. 
have a seat. We can have the young people make their way back to the back at this time. And as they do that, I'm going to rearrange up here a little bit. There we go. Everybody's like, the box. What's in the box? For you to find out. You stand there, sit there, and you just wonder the entire time. A box. Well, go ahead and turn with me to Second Thessalonians chapter three, as we are going to be continuing our look at how a life worth living trusts in the ministry of the Spirit of God. Um, as we uh, look here in Second Corinthians chapter three, I'm going to ask you to stand as we read, and uh, so stretch those legs one more time. Out of respect for the word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse number 1, do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when, Christ, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Our Father, we come asking you to give us understanding, to help us see the blind spot maybe that is in our lives that we are unaware of. 
Lord, might we be able to see clearly that which maybe has been hidden from us. And Lord, we thank you for the enabling of your Holy Spirit in our lives with the new covenant. Lord, without the Spirit within us, Lord, we would really be struggling. And Lord, may we have better understanding through about the Holy Spirit today as a result of these scriptures. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. And as you are seated, last week, I think you all would agree that you were treated to two very wonderful testimonies. As we had baptism last week, and we had just some wonderful um, testimonies regarding what God had done. And let me just rehearse a little bit of that with you. One uh, was regarding Hannah Weaver, and uh, with it, she shared how she was uh, found herself underneath her own bed in fear, and she was wrestling with God, and as a result, God brought to her Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and he restoreth my soul. That was the part that just began to resonate within her heart. She said that she pulled out her paper Bible, and she began to read over and over and over again Psalm 23. And it was through that encounter with God that she began to see the transformation in her life almost instantaneously. And Kevin Yoey, he shared his testimony, and here he was in a dugout. Baseball dugout next to the railroad tracks, homeless. And it was God who met him there. And it was then that he cried out to God for salvation. And God did a miraculous work. You see, with it, it's very interesting. I was talking to the Weaver clan, and uh, as they heard Hannah's testimony, what they were all saddened about was we would have been there had we known. And I shared with them, God didn't want you there. You see, when God does a work in our life, it's not us who does the work. It's his spirit of God who meets them and transforms them and does the work. Sometimes we get in the way of what God wants to do. And with it, Paul, in this portion of 2 Corinthians, is telling the folks, we don't need letters of commendation. For the Spirit of God is that letter of recommendation who has changed your hearts. And because of that change that has happened... That it recognizes or it commends the ministry that I had to you. I share with you the word of God. You wrestled with the word of God. And as a result, you were transformed by the power of God. So those who come to your church and say, well, if I come, this is what's going to happen. If I come, this is what's going to happen. Oh, no, folks. We can't tell the spirit of God to do the work of God when to do the work of God. For he does it when and where he so desires. And sometimes we can play the Savior when he says, get out of the way, I'm the only Savior. Have you been there with your family when you're trying to rescue them from things that they have done? God is often telling us, get out of the way. You're trying to do my work. And it's my work that needs to be done. And it's my spirit who is able to do it. And I think as Christians... We get in the way of God, don't we? We try to fix a lot of stuff when we need to be praying and asking God to do his work. And so this morning as we look at these things, we, we are talking about a man by the name of Paul who had an encounter with God. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute believers. He was against those who claimed to be Christians. And while he was going to Damascus, God knocked him right off of that donkey onto the ground, and it was God that he had an encounter with. And it was God who transformed the apostle Paul. It wasn't a person. It wasn't another preacher. It was the Spirit of God who intersected his life, who said, Paul, we need to have a conversation. And thankfully, Paul listened. And I am standing here in a room filled with a lot of people who have experienced that transformation. And aren't you glad for what God has done in your life? Uh, Amen. You are, wow. You need some awakening today. 
Because God is doing a work in our lives, and so often we forget that. And I don't want you to forget what God has done and what God wants to do in our lives. It is his work. Notice here as we begin, and we're going to be starting really in verse number four. For the new covenant we talked about last week, it gives life. And how does it give life? Notice here in verse six. Uh, it talks about, but the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives what? Life. And it is through the Spirit of God that we are awakened. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And as you do, I want you to listen to these words that Paul penned in his first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse number 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human words or understanding, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, Paul just simply said what? I am not eloquent. I am not a, a great orator. I am not a person who is a great motivational speaker. And I didn't want that to be. Because I wanted to see the work that God wanted to do. And it was his power, not my power. It was a simple message. It wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't anything that was uh, brand new. It was just a message that I've preached over and over and over again. And God did a marvelous work. And how did it happen? He didn't write a book about it, did he? He didn't sit down and say, now, these are 10 steps to revival. This is how to grow your church. There wasn't anything except one thing that caused the, the, the transformation in Corinth. The power of the Spirit of God. God moved, God did his work, and things happened that were beyond even Paul's control. So often we go to self-help books to figure out how we need to do things. And the problem is, we need the Spirit of God to do a work in our life. And Paul was here saying, it's not by human wisdom it is not by human intellect, but it was by the power of the Spirit of God. That's what it was. That's case open and closed. There's nothing more to report. How are lives changed? How are lives changed? You can go to the grocery store and you can pull a magazine off the rack. You can go online and you can see 10 steps, 5 steps, 6 steps, all these things in order to change your life. But that's not God's way to change a life. God is not into steps and us doing this, number one, number two, number three, number four. You know what that sounds like? Sounds like following the law. Do you ever think about some of the things that are self-help? They are only driving you back to the old covenant idea of thinking. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. Bingo. How many of you have followed a diet plan? And it did not give you the results that you expected. Oh, yes. I'm going to do this, 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 and it doesn't work for me. It did for your neighbor. It did for that person, but it didn't work for you. Folks, if we want to see our lives changed, if we want to see the power of God in our lives, then it must be done through the Spirit of God, not through our own effort. And you say, boy, that seems kind of strange. What is Paul talking about? And we're going to look briefly over these next few verses, but I want to show you the difference between the power of the Spirit versus the Old Covenant. Take a look at these things here. He says in verse 6, 
that the old covenant, the law, it kills. But what does the new covenant bring? It brings life. He goes on and he says this in verse number seven. It's a ministry of death. But what is the new covenant? It is the ministry of the spirit or by the spirit. The old law, the covenant, the keeping of the law, it was dependent upon your ability to keep it. But now the new covenant brings the spirit of God into our lives and so that we have an aid, someone who is going to help us keep the law in a way that the law itself was vacant of. It had no help. It had nobody to assist. It was based on your ability to do it. But now we have the Spirit of God. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. He goes on to describe some more things. He says here, verse number 9, it's a ministry of condemnation. Now, which law do you want to live by? Do you want to live by the old covenant or do you want to live by the new covenant? It kills. It's a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. What does that mean? It will only tell you when you're wrong. When a police officer pulls you over, we said this weeks ago, someone, of course, there's a loophole. Someone pulled him over and said, oh, you're driving really nice. Not for me. When a police officer pulls me over, you know what he's telling me? You are over the speed limit. You got a light out. You got a brake light out. Something's wrong. You, you have broken the law in some way. The law is only that which punishes. That's what it does. He goes on here, but the new covenant is the ministry of righteousness. It provides us with a righteousness that is not our own. What an amazing thing this is. And again, further explanation will come. It is also the old covenant, verses 10 and 11, it says it fades away. It's temporary. It wasn't meant to be permanent. But on the flip side, what is the new covenant? It is unfading and eternal. And so as we just compare these covenants, and we talked at length about this last week, and so I didn't want to spend a lot of time in these passages. But he's saying here, look, do you want to be old covenant or you want to be new covenant? Do you want the assistance of the Spirit of God in your life or do you want to be the one who's pushing and shoving and doing everything in your life? Well, thank goodness when the new covenant came, Jesus promised his disciples that in it he would bring a helper, a comforter, and that was the Holy Spirit of God. And so in this whole second or third chapter, the focus is on the Spirit of God. Notice here in verse number three, he talks about the Spirit. Verse number uh, six, the Spirit is mentioned twice. Look down at verse number 8, the ministry of the Spirit. Further, as we go in verse number 17, the Spirit is mentioned two more times. And then in verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is mentioned again. The new covenant has with it something that the old covenant didn't have, the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God doesn't sit on the outside, but he comes and indwells us and lives with us and never leaves us nor forsakes us. That is the power truly behind the new covenant that is given to us of living. So let's take a closer look at this, and we're going to go here to verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13. He comes in here and he says, uh, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Not only does the new covenant give us life by the Spirit, but also it brings boldness by the Spirit. Now, what does he mean by that? In order for us to better understand this, I'm going to have you turn to Exodus 34 because the rest of our time is going to be alluding back to what is in Exodus 34. So go there with me, and we're going to read about Moses and this encounter that Moses would have with God. Exodus 34, verses 29 through 35. This is after Moses had already come down the mountain once. And he broke the Ten Commandments because the people were worshiping a golden calf. 
This is his second time spending time with God. He comes down off the mountain, and this is what happens. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. And so we have this encounter that Moses has with God. It's almost like charging up a battery. He would be in the presence of God. His face would shine because of the glory of God. He would go out to the people. He would instruct the people. And they looked upon him and his face would brightly shine. And with it, as we come to this portion of scripture, we begin to think, okay, Lord, what was going on here? And so we have in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 13. Verse 13, it says, Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. So Moses put the veil on his face, not because the children of Israel couldn't handle the brightness of the glory of God in that regard. But rather, he put the veil over his face after he instructed them because he didn't want them to see that the glory of God was fading. Now think about that. That's the old covenant. It was temporary. It was fading. It could not hold its glory. And the new covenant is better, and it gave Paul boldness Because that glory would not fade. And as you think on that, I want you to consider knowing that God's power lives within us. He goes with us wherever we go. Does the Spirit of God fade? No. You know what? When you came into this building today, those of you who are followers of Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God living in you. Guess how much glory was there? God's glory is indwelling you because the Spirit of God indwells you. That's kind of miraculous, isn't it? You're thinking, well, I sure don't look like it. But the reality is, is that his power goes with you no matter what. Now think on this. How, does this brought, how did this bring Paul boldness? Did you ever get up on a morning and, boy, you had your devotions, you had prayer time. Man, you just felt like you were so close to God. And you're walking throughout the day and you just feel the presence of God. And you think, man, it's a good day. Now, how many of you had a day where you get up in the morning, you don't have your time with God? In fact, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, you shouted at somebody, you're upset, you're angry, you're just having a grumpy bad day. You're a grumpy old man, a grumpy old lady, you're grumpy, grumpy, grumpy. You went to school, and while you were at school, you got into it with your friends, and it's just like, what a miserable day. And then an opportunity came where you could share Christ with somebody, and you go, I can't, because I didn't have my time with God today, and I've been grumpy and everything else. The Spirit of God, whether you've had a good day or bad day, His power is still with you. This was so wonderful to me, because my ability or my opportunity to share with someone is not based upon the day I'm having. It's based upon the Spirit of God doing a work through my life. 
He doesn't fade because I didn't have my devotions in the morning. Now, is it good to have your devotions in the morning? Yeah, it's a good thing. Is it good to pray first thing? Absolutely. But my ability to minister for God is not dependent upon my work or my ability. And that seems totally contra- counteractive. It's like, you got to be kidding me. No, because the Spirit of God indwells us. And that gives us boldness. It gives us the opportunity to know that I am not, my, my day is not based upon what I've done. It's about who lives within me. Can I turn to him in the moment's notice? Amen. Do I have to go and make a bunch of sacrifices? No. <laughs> Dear God, you are so gracious to me. And that was Paul. His sufficiency was not in his ability, but God's ability to work in and through him. And again, don't walk away and say, Pastor Craig said that you don't have to read the Bible. It's no good. It doesn't mean a thing. That's not what I said. I didn't say not to pray. I didn't say follow God. I didn't say spend time with God. That is not what I'm saying. But Moses He had to be in the presence of God in order to have the glory of God. And when he moved away from the presence of God, guess what? The glory began to fade. When I meet with God, I already have the Spirit of God. And when I go to move away from my Bible time, guess who goes with me? The Spirit of God. Christian, you're alive. He is in you, living, working every moment of the day, and he is ready to present himself at any time, whether you're ready to present him or not. But that also means that he will convict you. (laughs) You're having a grumpy day and you yelled at somebody. Guess what the Spirit of God does? And if that doesn't work, he begins to yell at you. Hello, I thought you're supposed to be a God follower, a Christ follower. I thought you loved me. I know, I'm a Christian. I can change if I have to. Yes, Lord, I hear you. But you see, Moses, as he moved away from the presence of God, his confidence and boldness begin to wane a little bit because it's like, okay, I know these truths, but with we as believers, oh my goodness, he walks with us everywhere we go. What a wonderful truth that is. But not only that, look further here as we go down to verses 14 through 16. The new covenant also gives us understanding by the Spirit of God. He gives us understanding. It talks about the veil being lifted. And as we think about this veil that's being lifted, he's really talking about the Jewish people. The Jewish people, they were orthodox, straight in their thinking. The old covenant is what they believed in. In fact, I just listened to a testimony of a Jewish person who became a Christian. And they, they were reading Isaiah 53, And if you're familiar with Isaiah 53, it is a picture of Jesus Christ. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the transgression of our own sin has been laid on him. Oh, my goodness. you, You can't read Isaiah 53 as a Christian and say, oh, my goodness, that's Jesus Christ. He was reading Isaiah 53, and he goes, oh, my goodness, that's Jesus He called his mother, and he says, Mom, listen to this. And she goes, that's Jesus. What are you reading? You need to stop reading the New Testament. That's wrong, that's wrong, it's wrong. He goes, Mom, I'm not reading the New Testament. I'm reading Isaiah 53. She came to know Christ as her Savior. The transformational power of God to do a work. But they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that he is the Messiah. They have a veil that's over their eyes that they cannot see. As he speaks here, we hear, obviously, of Paul and his conversion. 
my goodness, Paul, when he was converted, he had what were like scales on his eyes. And, and it talks there in Acts chapter 9 about how he had scales on his eyes and the prophet Ananias would come along. And he would touch him and heal him and the scales would fall away and then he would be baptized. Well, why did he have scales on his eyes? I believe that it was simply this. Because as Paul himself, there was a visual, physical blindness that was given to him, just like the Jews had a spiritual blindness. And when those scales are removed, oh my goodness, now I see. He gives us understanding that is not our own. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, you may hear yourself say, okay, I read the Bible, but it doesn't make sense to me at all. I don't get it. I mean, I read it, I hear it, but it just doesn't seem to do anything for me. My question for you is, do you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you? Have you had a genuine conversion? Have you repented of your sin and entered into the new covenant of Jesus Christ? Listen to the words that are written here, verse 9. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his, what? Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except who? The Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The reason some people cannot understand the word of God is because the spirit of God who gives understanding of the scriptures doesn't live within them. For when the spirit of God comes into someone's life, suddenly the word of God begins to make sense to them. For example, when I say, uh, and, and when I say my goodness, uh, when people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it's almost like they have new ears they hear things that they've never heard. They understand things that they've never understood before. When they understand what baptism is all about, suddenly it's like, oh, that makes sense. The old man is buried with Jesus Christ, and a new man is risen again. It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Now, if you're sitting here going, I have no idea what you just said, Pastor Craig. I ask you, do you have the Spirit of God living inside of you? Now, in this box... Pair of binoculars. Seeing what you guys are all doing in the back right now. <laughs> the binoculars allow me to see further than I can with my own regular eyes. The Spirit of God is like putting binoculars to your eyes so that you can see things that you couldn't see apart from them. That's what the Spirit of God does. He allows us to see things in the Word of God that we just could not see before. And if you are sitting here today and you go, Pastor Craig, I'm embarrassed to admit, but I think I might be without the Spirit of God. Don't be embarrassed. Be thankful that God is revealing that to you right now. Because I want you to be able to see the things of God as God has brought them forth. I want you to be able to open up God's word and say, oh my goodness, I now understand what that means. I understand and I see the things that I could not see before. I understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I know what it means to be baptized by the Spirit of God. I understand these things. But apart from the Spirit of God, you will not have the understanding that God has for you waiting for you. A third thing, or fourth thing, I guess it is here, 
is this. He gives us liberty. He gives us liberty. Verses, uh, verse number 17. He says, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is the most exciting thing to me. Liberty. We as Americans, we love freedom, do we not? We fought for freedom. We don't want to be under the control of another per se. But what is it that we are free from? Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is Paul's great declaration of freedom from the law. And by freedom from the law, what he means is this. Freedom of the law's punishment. Of the law's restrictiveness. Freedom from the penalty of my sin. In other words, because for the wages of sin is what? Oh, if that scripture ended right there, we would all be doomed. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Freedom, liberty, do I deserve to die for my sin? You can say yes. I deserve it. That's where I stand. But Christ stood in my spot and he paid the price for my sin. And because of that, there is now therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay, Christian. When you stand before God one day, he's not going to replay your life and point out all the bad things that you ever did. Oh my goodness. If that were the case, we would need eternity probably just to go through that. He is not going to punish you and me for our sin because the punishment has already been paid out. It has already been placed on Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, we don't deserve it, but we are blessed. We are free. Verse number two, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Romans 8, it, it, it's like a, a, a musical score that begins to just crescendo higher and higher and higher and higher. If God be for us, who can be against us? Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor, nor things to come. My goodness, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Nothing. We may say, you know what? I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to do this more, I'm going to do this more, I'm going to do this more. How many of you have made those New Year's resolutions? You are going to be a better Christian because of all the things that you were going to do. Four to six weeks later, you're down in the dumps because you have not fulfilled these things. Christian, there is now therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Live like you're free. Praise God for the freedom that he gives you. Praise God for the release that he gives you. Praise God for the liberty that you have in him. Does that mean that we go on sinning? No, absolutely not. Let us not abuse the liberty that has been given to us. Amen? May we live in response to that liberty as respectable citizens of the kingdom of God. May we respond to this liberty that he has given to us in a way that glorifies him and magnifies him. 
Not long ago, we had a young person who uh, said um, he was just, he was honest. He just was struggling with, you know, mom said I need to do this. And you know what? I just, I just do it part way. And then she yells at me. But that's okay. Every Thursday, she tells me to do this. I do it part way. And then she yells at me. It's okay. I couldn't let that go. I looked at him and I said, you don't love your mother, do you? I said, you don't love her. What? You don't love your mom. Because if you love her, what will you do? You will do it all the way. Your lack of love for your mom causes you to do chores part way. Well, you know, and then I said, you know, that's what Jesus said to us. If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. It's not based upon the law of the Ten Commandments. It's on the fact of, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? Think about what he has done for you. Once you recognize what he has done for you, the liberty that he has provided for you, what kind of response ought that bring to us in our service for God? Yes, Lord, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? Let me show you my gratitude and my appreciation. I got a report a week later. Pastor Craig, Mom asked me to do that, and I did it all the way. And I thought, Ugh, if I love her, I'll do it. If I love her, I'll do it. If I love her, I'll do it. This past week, he prayed in youth group. Dear God, yes, I love my mom. <laughs> and he just went on this prayer. It was the cutest thing ever. And I thought, praise God for that. He gets that. Now, can he transfer that to anything else? I have no idea. But he got it with his mom. If we love God then we will serve him all the way with a joyful heart. And it brings liberty. I don't have to be told, and that was the next thing. You don't have to be told what to do. You're looking for ways to show your love and gratitude to God. I have freedom to do that which is right. I have freedom to please my God. I have freedom to do these things. Oh my goodness, that's so liberating. I have the freedom and liberation to do that which pleases him. He goes on to verse number 18. Not only does he free us, but verse number 17, 18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same glory from glory to glory, or from glory, to glory just as the Spirit of the Lord. The new covenant transforms us by his spirit. This whole idea, a couple things here. The word transform means it's the Greek word metamorphosis, just like a butterfly. It's changing from one thing to another thing. It's becoming something more beautiful, something better. It's being transformed means it's continuous. It's, it's something has happened to it. And that's what happens with us. When we become a Christian, something happens to us. We don't make it happen. It happens to us. I, I love, um, those of you who remember Jess Harbor, uh, they moved out of the area and uh, it was sad to see them leave, but Jess Harbor said these words. When he became a Christian, it was like somebody put a brand new pair of glasses on him the very next day. He could see Things that he had never seen. It was like, oh my goodness. And, and the things that he was used to doing, how he used to talk, he couldn't even talk that way anymore. It was like curse words were trying to come out of his mouth, but it was like he got choked up. It was like, Ugh. if I want them to come out of my mouth, I almost had to force them out. They're not natural anymore. And how do you explain it? Because there has been something that's been done to you that you can't explain except the Spirit of God has transformed you. That's the only explanation. 
It's done by his spirit. And what is he doing? He is changing us into whose image? The image of Christ. More and more like Christ. He's not going to make you more like Pastor Craig because you don't want to be like me. You don't. I don't want you to try to be like me. I want you to be like Jesus Christ because that's a whole lot better. Amen? Please say amen. Thank you. A little more, yeah, a little more passion, please. But that transformation that he is able to do, he wants you to be more and more and more like Jesus Christ himself. Romans 8, 28 and 29, verse 29 especially, where it talks about we are predestined to become like him. Romans 8, verse 29, it says these words right to us and very directly. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. May that be, and we know that is what he is transforming us more and more and more like. The Holy Spirit is a vital person in the Trinity, and he is holy God. For it tells us even in these scriptures, the Spirit of the Lord. The Lord and the Spirit are one. And along with this whole idea, I still have some more things in my box. And as we look at what's in this box, I have a couple things here. One, got my hammer. And I've got uh, a work glove. Got a work glove. And uh, this work glove was made to work. This work glove has a purpose, and... As you can tell, I've worked it right through the ends of it. But I'm going to say to that work glove, you go ahead and pick up that hammer. Come on, you were made to work. Let's go. Maybe it needs some encouragement. You can do it. You can do it. Maybe it needs some teaching, so it needs to go to church to get some instruction. Okay, here, this is what you're going to do. Take your thumb, put it around there. Come on, you can do it. Come on, okay. Pick up that hammer. Not gonna do it. I know. It needs some fellowship. Put some other gloves out there for it. <laughs> that'll work. That'll that'll help that glove. It, it's gonna probably. It, it's around other church people, so now it's gonna act. It, it's gonna. It, it's gonna be around some construction workers. It, it'll know what to do. No, it has no ability in and of itself to do the work that it was even made to do. Why? Because something's missing. And that is this. It has to have something alive put inside of it. Something more powerful than itself who then can do the work that it was created to do. And folks, the Spirit of God must indwell us in order for us to do the work that God has prepared us for. The question is, is the Spirit of God in you? That is the question that all of us should pretty much be able to tell pretty quickly. But along with it, maybe you're a Christian and you don't have the Spirit of God working very well in your life. You know why you don't have the Spirit of God working in your life? Because you are trying to live like an old covenant believer, do everything in your own power. You're trying to fix your life with your to-do things. This is what I'm going to do instead of yielding to the Spirit of God who wants to teach you the things of God and so that you will trust God and trust your life to do the things that he has called you to do. Paul knew that in order for the ministry to be sufficient, in order for it to have any effect at all, it had to have the Spirit of God's working. And he had to hear it, listen to it, and just do what the Spirit of God wanted. Now, it may have seemed foolish to many people, 
but it's the power of God to do his work. We have LifeWise Academy that we've talked about. It's a great program, but it needs the Spirit of God to infuse it to work through it. We have Vacation Bible School that we want to do. Now, we could do it, bang up job. We can have all the nice things about it, but if the Spirit of God is not present, then guess what? It will not have the Spirit's power behind it. We have a missions trip that we're going to be taking to the Dominican Republic. We need the Spirit of God to do a work in our individual lives so that when we go to do it, that it will be the Spirit's working, not just our working. You have situations in your home, and the question is, is God allowed to do his work in and through you, or are you taking it upon yourself and doing it your way? God's way is scary because you have to give up control. You have to do what he asks you to do. You are having to follow his lead, just like that young man. Well, do I really love my mom? If I really love my mom, then I will. If I really love God, and Christian, ask yourself, do we love God? And we would say, yes, we love God. Are we going all the way with him? Are we picking and choosing what we will do with him? He wants you to go all the way so that his power can be revealed through his working. But it requires you to submit yourself to his control and his power and have ears to hear him. It may seem a little uncomfortable at the beginning, but if you want to see his power, then you must submit to it. Paul learned that. Paul knew that. And that's what Paul was teaching the church of Corinth. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come and Lord, we thank you that we are able to have your word before us. Lord, that we have the opportunity to be reminded of the power that really resides within us. It's not our power. It's not up to us to wield it wherever we want. Father, I pray that we will be submissive to you, that we'll be yielded to you. Lord, we will allow you to do the work that you want to do in our lives, and as a result, that we can see your work. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and I ask you to stand right where you are. What is it in your life right now that you need to just yield to the Spirit of God? You're trying to live the new covenant life with old covenant principles. You're trying in your own effort, your flesh, your own understanding. And you're powerless. You're as powerless as the work glove. You need to ask and yield yourself to the Spirit of God if you're a Christian and you're just not listening. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you don't have even the understanding of Scripture at all, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. Are you truly a follower of Christ? Are you truly a Christian? Have you repented of your sin and entrusted Him for your salvation? If you have not done that, I want to encourage you, do not leave this place today without coming. St. Pastor Craig, Pastor BJ, someone else, I need to know Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I need the Spirit of God to indwell me because I am tired of living this life of sin. I need a Savior to give me his righteousness. I can't do it. I'm exhausted. Allow him to do that work in your life. Father God, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to hear your words, to be challenged by your words, 
to understand more what the Spirit of God and the importance of your Spirit is in our life. Lord, may we have that boldness. Lord, may we have that uh, understanding. May we have uh, your understanding of things in our life. Lord, may we be able to boldly stand when others may falter because we know that you are with us. Pray, Lord, that you'll just do your work here today in the lives of people and throughout this week. And may we go and tell others also. We pray this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As the praise and worship team are here, we're going to sing Trust and Obey. What a great way to end. If you need to talk to any one of us here today before you leave, I encourage you, before you leave, uh, come and and hunt one of us down or uh, just hang around and say, you know what, I need to speak to you before I leave. Uh, That invitation is always open to you. So let's sing together Trust and Obey. applicable. You think about that song, think about the opposite. How can we be happy in Christ when we distrust and disobey? That's the other option. Where are we today? Um, I hate to make an announcement after that sermon and that, but uh, anyway, uh, coming up, a couple of things we want to remind you of. Um, uh, We have a bridal shower coming up next Saturday. That is in there. Also, uh, we are having the blood drive tomorrow here. So if some of you could stay after and help set up tables and chairs, I know that would be a big help to the guys as they do that. And uh, also, make sure you look at Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. We have special schedules for those, so make sure that you have that on your calendar. 
And uh, with that, let's pray and be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the fact that we have your spirit living in us. That, God, we don't have to do the work. We simply have to surrender and to ask you to do the work. And you do it for us. Your burden is light and your yoke is, your yoke is light and your burden is easy. Lord, help us to rely on you and not ourselves. Help us to trust and obey. And Lord, give us courage in the face of those things that we would say, oh, I don't want to give that up. I'm so scared. Lord, help us not to be scared. And that we may come back next week with a testimony of how relying on your spirit makes it so easy and so wonderful in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Thank you. That's what was missing. I've been sitting here all day thinking, what am I missing? And that is it. Um, one more week, get your cards for the Gibsons to Pam, and we are going to send bundle them all up, send them down, and uh, send those to them along with a gift. So let's do one more week and get that done. Thank you.